Hi, I'm Juan. Uh, I want to thank NSF and CSA and the Blue Waters team for inviting me, giving me the opportunity to tell you guys what we've been doing for the past seven years on Blue Waters. Um, we primarily use Blue Waters as a, a scientific instrument to understand the life cycle of HIV. We're focused on very different aspects of the virus, and this is pretty much how we like to see ourselves using the machine. Uh, we're trying to understand every aspect of the life cycle utilizing the computer, but also combining a series of molecular biology, cell biology, NMR, crystallography, and all the other tools that are available to any other scientist to understand this uh, complicated system. So we just use Blue Waters as an instrument to uh, understand ultimately how does a virus work in a cell. So there's this is a term that Klaus used to use a lot, it's called the computational microscope. And again, this is to reiterate our use of the supercomputer as an instrument in where we uh, set up our experiments and our, the answers are that we get are as good as the experiment that we set up. Something that is the underlying principles of our methods are all atomistic molecular dynamic simulations and we've proven over the past seven years that we can we have really pushed about the, the limits of the size in collaboration obviously with the supercomputing agencies and uh, we have been doing virus capsids for quite some time there's also a lot of efforts to work on small organelles with the ultimate goal of studying a, a full cell in its full glory at a domestic level um, I'm going to start well, I was a big user of uh, past PRAC allocation in the lab of Klaus Schulten. As Jim mentioned, we published, uh, we had, uh, had access to his PRAC from 2012 to 2016, the year he passed away. Uh, we published a series of important manuscripts uh, starting from the structure of the capsid, uh, revealing important details about where does the curvature occurs, what, is, what are the very critical contacts that occur in the capsid at atomistic level. We also did a series of important manuscripts trying to elucidate the interactions between cellular host factors and, uh, and, the, and the capsid. We were pretty lucky to get a cover in nature. Here what I'm showing you is the proof of a cover in nature for those of you who have never seen it. It actually looks different than when it goes in print. Uh, we were also actually, our work was very uh, relevant in uh, viral, for the virology community. There is this conference, CROI, which occurs every year and is really focused on medicinal chemistry and new the development of new therapeutics for HIV. But um, ever since, obviously, I've moved to Delaware, I've started my own group. We are also working on HIV, it's one of our lines of research. And we're pushing, again, the, the boundaries of what's known in HIV not only trying to reproduce experimental res re results, we're really trying to make predictions that can be tested experimentally and that reveal the underlying mechanisms that the virus employ during the life cycle. In this case, I'm gonna talk about two very short stories. One is this uh, MXB protein, which I'm showing you in a very artistic representation using glass, steel, and some brown material. MXV is a very interesting protein because it's a human protein. It's an endogenous human protein. Unlike many other restriction factors, MXV, it actually confers uh, immunity to some cell types, to some cell, human cell types. Every single person in this room has MXV in your blood, and MXV is capable of preventing H uh, HIV infection. However, it's extremely weak. so. The goal here is try to understand how is MXB restricting HIV in our, in, our, in our actual body and trying to develop new therapeutics to potentiate the, act, the action of MXB. This work uh, has been done in collaboration with um, a series of experimentalists. Um, the basic idea is that you have your capsid, you have your genome, and MXB is extremely potent. It, uh, it affects several stages of the life cycle of the virus. It prevents encoding. It prevents the nuclear import, and it also affects integration. However, the molecular details of the mechanism are absolutely unknown, so that's where we use enhanced sampling techniques, large-scale simulations on blue waters to try to understand the, uh, the, the structural elements and the molecular elements that confer activity, that confer the restriction activity to the virus. This is a model we published in 2017 uh, in collaboration with uh, Pei Yun Shang that published that in Science Advances. However, we didn't, in that the study, we didn't establish 
the molecular interactions between MXB and the capsid. But however, we pushed that forward, and we've actually published this year with the help of Blue Waters and other supercomputers, the uh, specific interactions between the, what is the so-called N-terminal domain of MXB and the HIV-1 capsid. So now, uh, as I said before, we've done this blindly, uh, unlike other restriction factors that have been known to be active against HIV for more than 20 years. MXB was, came to the light uh, four years ago. And we have been the group who have established the molecular mechanism that, by which uh, MXB interacts with the capsid and also the very precise type of interactions which occur in this little short peptide and the HIV-1 capsid. And if you guys want to learn more, we have two studies that have been published, one in Science Advances, the other one in Structure. It uh, came out last week and it reveals all the important details between the two structures. The second part that we are very focused in my group is trying to establish the uh, molecular determinants of so-called um, adapter proteins, in this case, FES1. FES1 is a, um, a, a small peptide, a small protein that serves as a mediator between kinesin and the capsid. As you might think in the cytoplasm, cytoplasm is a highly crowded environment. It's not, the capsid doesn't get to the nucleus by free diffusion. So we're very interested in understanding this process called trafficking. There is another uh, advantage to studying FES1. FES HIV is not infective in all cell types. HIV infects T cells differently than macrophage. But more importantly, neurons are immune to HIV. And the reason that neurons are immune to HIV is because they overexpress FES1. So we're really trying to understand what are the underpinning mechanisms by which the capsid interacts with FES1 with the hopes to develop, again, new therapeutics that target FES1 and the capsid. Uh, this study was also uh, performed using large-scale simulation and uh, enhanced sampling techniques to establish the exact binding site. Again, all, one of the biggest problems with these uh, capsid protein interactions is that involve intrinsically disordered proteins, which are not amenable to crystallography or uh, NMR or cryo-electron microscopy. So we, uh, we published that study in uh, cell reports. It's still not out, but it should be out uh, a couple of weeks. And we're moving forward to trying to establish the exact mechanism that, rela that relates capsid, uh, uh, tubulin, and other motor proteins for, as I mentioned before, uh, capsid trafficking. Another study that is uh, undergoing in my group is related to the so-called reverse transcription. HIV is a retrovirus, which means that RNA is um, initially inside of the capsid. At some, at some moment, there is a DNA synthesis, and this process uh, this uh, process uh, of synthesizing DNA from an RNA template is so-called reverse transcription. The big question is if reverse transcription occurs in an intact core, how do the nucleotides that are required to fuel the DNA synthesis get into the intact capsid? So again, using uh, enhanced sampling techniques and large computational resources like blue waters, we even established the molecular mechanisms of exact uh, passage of nucleotides through these hexameric channels. And we've also introduced the effects of other small molecules, in this case, melitic acid. And because we have fully atomistic details, we see very important difference between another small molecule that we discovered last year that is important for capsid uh, stability and uh, capsid maturation, which is a call inositol hexaphosphate, IP6. And we see clear differences between IP6 and melitic acid, and we see clear differences between R nucleotides and D nucleotides, hence, telling us the importance of performing these calculations in full atomistic detail. We have been able to establish this uh, study. Here is a, this is a representative translocation event. As I said before, we do ensemble calculations, try to understand how the nucleotides go through the pore. And if there's an active mechanism, we're also, again, making predictions that then can be verified experimentally. So we work very closely with the experimentalists to design specific experiments to, the, to test our, hypo our, our discoveries. So they are real discoveries and not just a validation of an experimental observation. We're also moving forward to um, a, stu a, s a study of the so-called immature lattice. We're very interested in the development of maturation inhibitors. We've been doing that for several years now, uh, since 2015. Um, we've uh, established models of GAC lattice. Again, we do these models at atomistic level. In this case, we don't only do HIV, we do comparati comparative analysis with other retroviruses that are of, of the subfamily of the lentiviruses, like the equine infections acquired. This is the, essentially the HIV for horses. 
It has a very different uh, infection cycle than HIV, but it allows us to understand by comparative analysis the, um, some of the, uh, the very fine elements that um, confer, for instance, the elasticity and the physical properties of a GAC or immature lattice. And why is it different than um, HIV and so on? So we do for this, we develop very high resolution structures using, uh, this is from carrier electron tomography data, and you guys can see we have, again, atomistic level detail, so we don't omit any, any detail in our calculations, and very importantly, uh, for what I mentioned before, we introduce even small molecule cofactors um, that are very important to the stability of the, of the capsid. For instance, uh, this is a, a very, important discovery that highlights why we need to do these calculations in its full atomistic glory. If you ignore, for instance, the introduction of IP6 in your calculations, uh, we, we don't really know if you're simulating the real system or some other virus like RSV or EIV, which don't depend on IP6. In any case, uh, to summarize the products that we produce in my, in my group since I started my tenure track position, we published a series of 14 papers. Uh, uh, we've developed a lot of uh, um, a new tool that we've been using to categorize the interiors and exterior of uh, arbitrary shapes. And this is related to a problem that Noah was presented before, which is related to the pressure inside of closed containers. Um, we uh, have a series of uh, structures that we publish in the PDB that have been also derived in my group in, the hel in help with the, uh, the supercomputers. Last but not least, we, uh, we receive a lot of contributions from the Blue Water staff. Um, th they uh, gave us a lot of guidance and when we develop analysis algorithms. Also, I know that uh, my Jim has been helping some of my students when he sees them doing something crazy, running very a lot of independent jobs. He makes suggestions, so it's very nice to have this type of feedback, especially when you are a second year assistant professor and you're trying to get onto so many things. It's nice to have the Blue Water staff caring about what kind of things we're doing. Um, we have a lot of support from the staff for um, dissemination of our, 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 art of our articles, which I think is pretty essential for our scientific goals. Um, also, as I said before, we've worked on a lot of other projects with the uh, NCSA. We've made a little augmented reality visualizations using um, uh, cell phones and uh, the staff has, extremely, has been extremely supportive with our data storage and uh, archival archival staging and transferring um, because we produce a lot of data so it's always as everybody in this room probably knows it's a hassle so finally I want to acknowledge all my collaborators um, obviously um, we have a large network of collaborators and perhaps uh, one of the mo most collaborative people in the HIV field uh, my group uh, my, uh, a lot of the work that I presented here has been done by students in my group we have uh, access to many of the resources in Pittsburgh and TAC, including Anton too. Uh, but obviously uh, a lot of the research that I've shown has been performed using the Blue Water supercomputer. Uh, we received funding from NIH, NIAID, and General Medicine. And uh, well, um, I wanna thank you guys for taking the time to listen to my talk. <laughs>